It is, as I said, wonderful to be together, and we are concluding, we are concluding this short series of lessons that I have prepared talking about abundant Christianity. We've looked at the first perspective of, of abundant Christianity, as I've kind of tried to lay it out for you. In the first two lessons of this particular study, we want to get into the second perspective and bring it to a close today. We look at John chapter 10, as Monroe read a few moments ago, and where Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they have it more, may have it more abundantly. Now he precedes that particular part of that verse by saying, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And then he says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. When well, you think about all of the things we see all around us, all of the experiences that we experience individually, living life in this physical realm, in this world, we see a whole lot of the thieving and stealing and killing, don't we? But all kinds of other negatives that are just common to life in this world. But Jesus contrasts that when he says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now, we can understand that particular statement. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly from two perspectives. We looked at the first perspective talking about how we need to see the Christian life, Christianity, as the most abundant life that any person can live. It has the most abundant blessings. It has the most abundant promises, the most abundant hope, the most abundant fulfillment that any lifestyle could offer anybody else in this world. Truly, the Christian life is an abundant life. We looked at some of the ways, and you could probably come up with more, how God blesses us by virtue of our being Christians. And these are blessings that are unique to those who are Christians. They're not blessings upon everybody in the world who has not yet come to Christ repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in him openly, and surrendering their lives to him through baptism for the remission of their sins, these blessings are for Christians. Well, first we noted that Jesus, in coming to him, his way, through Christ, he brings us to God. John 14 and verse 6. And by virtue then of being in Christ, being baptized into him, Romans 6 and verse 3, Galatians 3 and verse 27, then God bestows upon us all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 13. We are born again, as Je Je Jesus told Nicodemus, must happen for us to enter the kingdom of God, or heaven itself, have eternal life therein. John 3, verses 3 through 5. We are made new from a spiritual perspective, as the Apostle Paul brought out in 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 17. And we have been freed from sin. And that, that connection to sin there is likened in that particular context of Scripture as a, being a slave of sin. But we've been set free from sin. Romans 6 and verse 6. We're guided by the most reliable guidebook available to humanity. God's Word itself, the Bible. Matthew, 5 and verse, uh, Matthew 4 and verse 4. Psalm 119 and verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path to guide us through every day of our life, throughout our lives. We also experience profound joy coupled with the peace of God. Proverbs 16, I'm sorry, Psalm 16 and verse 11, and Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. God blesses us abundantly and continually and again in unique ways. James 1 and verse 17. Every perfect gift, every good gift is from God, is from above, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And we continually as Christians live in the abundance of God's grace. Romans 5 and verse 17. So that's the first perspective of when Jesus said, I have come that they may have life more abundantly. The abundant life of Christianity. 
Now, the second perspective as we finish our study. My example of abundant Christianity, my personal example of how I live the abundant Christian life. People need to see that all around me. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. He said, preceding that, you are the light of the world. And then he said, let your light so shine that others may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus tells us that we need to let the world around us who have yet to become true Christians see abundant Christianity in our lives, in our lives. Well, let's see how we should exhibit, how we should exemplify, be influences of abundant Christianity through our lives to everybody around us. As Christians, we have reason like nobody else to abound in real hope. There are a whole lot of people who talk about hope out there today, and they put it in all kinds of different perspectives. I've told the story many times about in teaching over a great many years. I remember when I was in college studying for the ministry and we already had our, our two little ones at that time, I believe, and we had a young lady who did some babysitting for us. And she was also a student in college, though much younger than I. And she was telling me that she had a, 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 an exam the next day. And I said, well, pray about it. And her response was pretty immediate. She said, I don't, th I don't think prayer is going to get it. I think i got to study. Well, you know, I understand. Now, that wasn't, that wasn't meaning that she was minimizing the power of prayer, but she indicated, I've got to put myself into it as well. A whole lot of people out there, they're hoping for all kinds of things, but they're missing the real hope, the foundational, fundamental hope that comes by being a Christian. And we need to exemplify that hope. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 15 and verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of people out there who are living in a nearly hopeless state of mind. They, don't, they, they know something's missing in their lives, but they, they don't really find themselves able to just put their finger on what it is. Well, it's God. It's, it's Christ. It's being a Christian. It's salvation in Christ. We need to exemplify in our lives how we are abundant in hope because we know who we are and we know where we're going. And when we're talking about hope, we're not talking about a wild wish or an unrealistic desire or dream, but we're talking about the desire plus the expectation of it being fulfilled. This hope, like no other, is described by the Hebrews writer as an anchor of the soul. In Hebrews 6 and verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. An anchor of the soul. Again, not a wild wish, but an anchor of the soul. Both sure and steadfast in which enters the presence behind the veil. Now then, we in our lives need to exemplify. We need to let people see by the confidence with which we live our lives from a spiritual perspective, this abundant hope. And because of that hope, because of who we are as Christians, we should abound in joy, abound in joy. What does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2? That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. And he was talking about a congregation in that particular text that, from a financial perspective, were pretty poor. But he says, in the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty, they abounded in the riches of their liberality. In Philippians 4 and verse 4, what does the Apostle Paul say about being a Christian? He said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. In the Lord is the key qualifier there. Because you're Christians because you have so much for which to be thankful. And that doesn't mean that we're going to drive around in the fanciest, most expensive vehicles. doesn't mean we're going to have the biggest home. You know, I just heard a story this past week on the radio. Uh, it was 
a program that was dealing with real estate, I believe, and real estate investments and sales and all of that. And, and they were talking about this one builder who he had this dream of building this 100,000 square foot home. And just a little bit of description they gave me, boy, you talk about opulence. And apparently he has $165 million in the rear, something like that, I believe, on, on the financing of it. Well, now, my question came, came to my mind, why in the world would somebody want to build a 100,000 square foot home? What are you gonna do with that? Why do you need that? We well, see that's, that's material things and that's not where our hope is really anchored. It is in Christ. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We're so blessed that we should be abundant in our thanksgivings to God for all of the blessings that he bestows upon us and has bestowed upon us. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 15, Paul wrote, For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through, many, through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Oh, what does he say when he wrote the first Thessalonians letter? 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You know, again, we live a, a, a unique lifestyle with that abundant hope, the confidence that we know who we are, what we are, and where we're going when this life is over. And so we can be thankful in every circumstance. Now that does not necessarily mean be thankful for that circumstance. Nobody is thankful that when they fall down and break their leg. Or nobody is thankful when they receive a life-threatening diagnosis of one kind or another. But we, even in those circumstances, we can be thankful because we know this is not the end for us. The best is yet to come when this life is over. Literally, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God. Our love should abound in knowledge and wisdom, we're told in the scriptures. We think about that. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul wrote, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Now think about the connection between those three elements there. Love, that it may abound more and more in knowledge and all discernment, which means understanding or wisdom. Well, think about that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and verse 12, as Christians, we're to abound in love. In fact, we ought to be the example of love as far as humankind is concerned to everybody in the world. They ought to be able to see, ah, now we're not talking about surface level emotional feelings here. We're talking, that's love over there. Paul wrote, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, he says just as we do to you. So we need to abound in love. But what else does Paul say there in Philippians 1 and verse 9? That your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, it's no wonder then that he instructs, that he encourages, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Well, how? Just by saying some words? Just by having a warm, fuzzy feeling? No, just by doing some things that look rather exemplary on given occasions. No, he says, be diligent. Diligent is a strong, active term. He says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. Why can we stand before God without having to be ashamed when we have been forgiven by the blood of Christ or through the blood of Christ, when we have been born again, how can we live that life of Christianity standing before God without needing to be ashamed? Paul says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, the King James Version says, instead of be, be diligent, study to present yourself approved to God. The idea is there, whether you, whichever way you translate it from the original Greek. 
We need to be diligent to get into God's word and understand it as fully as we can. And we need to abound also in wisdom and prudence, which is understanding. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 8, Paul wrote, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Have you ever known somebody who is really, really intelligent with book smarts? And they really, really needed to go to a barn someplace and rub up against a horse so they could get some horse sense. To put the book learning, the intellect, the, the, the academic intelligence into active motion. Oh, I have. You know, I've, I've, I've met those people. And that's not, that's not demeaning academic study. I've been to college. I double majored. I admire people who go and and I did a lot of graduate work, and I admire people who do all of that. I admire people who may not have all the degrees on their sleeve, but they're diligent students in whatever discipline of life that they really have pursued. He's talking here, though, about more than just book knowledge. He's talking about wisdom and prudence, and that's understanding. How can we put into practice, how can we utilize that intellectual knowledge that we have gained effectively and to God's glory. Well, we need to also abound. Look at what Paul writes here in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 7. As you abound in everything, and again, he's writing all of these verses of scripture in all of these different texts to Christians. As you abound in everything, and then he lays out, several things or several elements within our spiritual lives in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all diligence and in your love for us see that you abound in this grace also well, what is this grace that he's talking about there? Specifically it's the grace of giving now look at, he says we need to abound in faith, in speech in knowledge, in all diligence as Christians and in our love but we also need to abound in the grace of giving. Interesting, isn't it? Abound in this grace also. We need to abound just generally in the life of Christianity. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 1, he wrote, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. In our Christian lives, we need to abound in our Christianity. And that's not the, the idea of showing off. It's not the idea, certainly, of drawing undue, kind of, in an arrogant way, attention to ourselves. Look at me, how good I am. But it just ought to be a natural for us. This is the way I live. This is what I do. This is who I am. This is how I deal with life. We need to abound in Christianity. In 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, Peter wrote about the characteristics or the spiritual traits of a Christian. He says, also for this very reason, giving all diligence, and there's that word again, diligence, again, active pursuit. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance to perseverance godliness to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love those are those are characteristics of Christianity that we always ought to diligently pursue and nurture and that ought to be the way we live our lives he goes on and says for if these are yours and abound so not little smatterings here and there not just a little token bits of these characteristics, but if these are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to develop, we need to nurture these characteristics of Christianity in order that we can live the Christian life abundantly. We also need to abound in good works. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8 and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, 
may have an abundance for every good work. The Christian life, the faithful, dedicated Christian life is an active Christian life. It's not just sitting on the sidelines. It's not just letting somebody else do what needs to be done as the church or part of the church, and you are the church. It's not this building. It's you who have become Christians. Faith without works, James wrote three different times, is dead in James chapter 2. Verse 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And then when he went on in verse 20, he said, but you do, do you want to know, O man, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And then he makes a comparison that is inescapable as far as our understanding is concerned. In verse 26, he said, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And so true faith, Christian faith is active. Remember those words diligent and diligence that we've already looked at. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 14, Paul wrote, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. We need to be abundant in how we can bless others through our lives and especially our, our Christian brothers and sisters. And, and there needs to be a focus on benevolence along that line. We're family, and we need to care about each other as family. And our, our blessings need to be abundant when it's proper and appropriate and when we have the ability toward others. Now sometimes those are just spiritual blessings, and I shouldn't just use the word just spiritual blessings, but they're on a spiritual level, and we can be a blessing to others because how abundantly we've been blessed. We can encourage others, we can study with others, we can help others to grow in their faith and in their understanding of God's word and of Christianity. But then there are other ways where we can be more physically active and abundant in helping people in whatever way that they might need. That might be just sitting with somebody in the hospital. We, that might be cleaning somebody's house or bringing somebody food when they have been sick or when they've had surgery or maybe when they've lost a loved one. Maybe helping somebody who is down and out who have lost their jobs or whatever the case might be, but you get the idea. And then 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 we need to grow and abound in grace. Peter wrote there, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. A grow? The word abound is not in there specifically, but we understand that's exactly what the word grow means. We need to abound in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. People need to see Christ in us through the way that we live our lives. So we come back to John chapter 10 and verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. This world, this world is on a destruction mode. John tells us that in 1 uh, John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. He said, do not love the things of the world, because this world is passing away. This is not where our future lies. This is not where our hope lies. Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life. Now make that personal. Make the personal application. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life. Jesus said, I have come that I may have life and that I may have it more abundantly. Who in the world would want to walk away from that? From that promise, from that hope, from that blessing? Who would want to walk away from that? Our lives should consistently demonstrate the most abundant life 
that any human being could possibly hope for. And that's the life of being a Christian. Again, the most abundant blessings, the most abundant hope, the most abundant promises, the most abundant fulfillment. Being a Christian. My example of abundant Christianity needs to be evident to all the people around us, all throughout our lives. We can't put our Christianity in a box or slip it into our pocket or say, that's a private matter. And again, I'm not talking about going around and calling undue attention to ourselves. I'm talking about living the life, being the example, being there on a spiritual level for people who need that example. My life. My Christianity, my lifestyle as a Christian, it should be abundant and abundantly obvious to everybody around me. Now the question for each one of us. Jesus gave the great invitation. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And here's the key, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Are you looking for that rest for your soul? Are you looking for all the blessings in the, in the, in the heavenly places in Christ? Are you looking for all of those abundant blessings that God bestows upon us by virtue of our being Christians? Think about God holding all those out for you, offering them to you. Are you ready to take his hand? Surrender to him, surrender to your Savior, confessing your faith in him, repenting of your sins, and surrendering to him in baptism for the remission of your sins. We want to help you with that this very morning. If you need to study some more, we're here to help you with that, to get you ready. If you need the prayers of the church, we're here to pray with you and for you right now. If you'll step forward and let us know. If you need to come, come right now as we stand together and sing.